I guess like where you get to the fight, you like, Oh, it would not look as a big one if it's not high crime. <laughs> And uh, this collaboration has kind of uh, been a lot of fun, and we've really tried to find the, the most cutting-edge topics and the, the, the most cutting-edge speakers. And uh, I'm very proud to say that this semester we're going to have uh, one talk on AI, one talk on uh, blockchain, and, uh, and one on robot trading. So it's sort of all these topics that... Uh, that uh, we hear about, but we want to know more, and, uh, and uh, I'm very excited uh, to have these two speakers. The first of which uh, that, that is uh, with us here is Professor uh, Michael uh, Noguer Villalonso, and uh, he's, uh, he sort of has a, a background in uh, portfolio uh, uh, management, uh, portfolio, and, and then he sort of like caught the bug for uh, machine learning sort of early on and is now uh, director of the Artificial Intelligence uh, in Finance Institute. Um, and, uh, you know, has taught at Columbia, at NYU, and, and sort of uh, has a real hands-on approach uh, to, uh, to AI and machine learning and all these topics that we want to know more about. So without further ado, Miguel, thanks for coming. Okay. Yeah, thanks for having me, right? So we have, uh, uh, we will be discussing uh, how we can, so how we can, uh, we see or how we can use uh, uh, deep learning in finance, right? So we, uh, you know that deep learning has been su successfully and it's been successfully being used uh, for in many other in many other areas, right, like uh, obviously image recognition, language models, right, and uh, I would say that Fine is also doing a, a little bit of uh, uh, its contribution because we're doing uh, quite a lot of time series, which was a thing that, that it was developed uh, with the launch of the memory networks and recurrent neural networks, but more on language settings, right? So, and we are not right now, obviously, right, trying to see if uh, all these architectures can be can be successfully applied, right, uh, in finance. So this is what the, the the and we're gonna try to use the scientific method in the sense that there's there's uh, in finance some sort of. Uh, Everything is, as you know, it's very empirical. So time series are very noisy, it's very hard, are, are, uh, have a bunch of issues, and we need to see if these things are operate well in other, in other contexts, right, will be operating well uh, in finance. And the answer is uh, obviously complex and complicated. We'll see that in some, in some places, uh, for example, Oshita Memory Networks do a good job, in some others, maybe benchmark models still continue to do a good job, Right and and obviously the, the whole all the all the uh, all the very exciting applications of deep learning uh, for unstructured data, which is obviously something that's going to be very very useful. Right. Um, we we last year we founded the Artificial Intelligence Finance Institute in order to help right obviously collaborate and, and work with universities in the idea of doing uh, training and also obviously doing more research trying to see how we can use um, AI in finance, right? And, and we have uh, on our board people from, from NYU, from uh, 
from Ravenpark, from UBS, and so on and so forth, right? So we have a diverse set of professionals, right, trying to, to help us, right, uh, um, helping professionals and, or, and, or, and a bunch of machine learners that want to also understand what are, what are the, the, the issues of uh, using these models in finance, right? Um, last week we were in London, we were discussing, uh, yeah, there's a lot of machine learning research. Well, it's true, there's a lot of machine learning research, but if we look at the top journals in finance, we see that there's only, I don't know, maybe 80 papers, right? Or even less, right, that, that, that try to, to research uh, machine learning in finance. So there's a lot to do, right, in that sense, right? So it's, a, it's a, some sort of a young, right? Uh, so I really encourage you, right, to, to contribute to, uh, to the community with research papers, right? And we also have uh, uh, the Journal of Machine Learning in Finance and other that are specifically, right, uh, right? Because as we all know, right, so um, when, when we look at this, which is basically what, what can be, what are the, the, the different fields of machine learning in finance, I'm sure you look, the machine learning, I'm sure you, do, you, you all know well, Right, uh, supervised learning and supervised learning and reinforcement learning. We see here that basically we try to, to predict or describe. We try to, to describe an unsupervised learning. We try to be prescriptive. We, we try to decide uh, what is the policy, right, uh, when we try to do reinforcement learning. Whenever we look at this, some sort of three fields of machine learning, we see obviously that, that, that uh, I think the answer needs to be, the question needs to be the opposite, right? in the sense that, uh, tell me a place in which we cannot use, right, machine learning, right, if, if you think about it. Because basically, uh, all we do in finance, right, is uh, in many contexts predict or describe, right, whenever we, we try to uh, figure out default probabilities, whenever, whenever we try to, to, to figure out what are the, uh, the credit ratings of companies, we are obviously, right, on the supervised learning space. Well, and supervised learning space is going to is helping us right figure out whenever uh, we want to have some sort of a, a, a better understanding of the features of the data sets right so and supervised learning that it's also huge uh, it's also huge uh, feeling which is really under the, under research in finance where we don't have a lot of uh, unsupervised learning research right in finance I really also encourage you right to some sort of uh, help us build uh, more tools for um, unsupervised learning right and then we have all the excitement that we see these days on reinforcement learning so this idea of we have uh, we have a set of states uh, we define a reward function and our job is to some sort of learn right what would be uh, the optimal policy, the set of A's, the sequence of A's, right, that could maximize uh, the rewards, right? So obviously, uh, and there's, a, there's a, 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 there a lot to do in terms of reinforcement learning, right? because we, we just have uh, maybe five papers, right, that, uh, in top journals that, that do reinforcement learning in finance. So there's a lot to do there, right? Uh, I have to say, too, that uh, that reinforcement learning in finance might be uh, uh, probably very close to be a supervised to be supervised learning, right? Because it's time series, because the reward functions are well known, and so on and so forth. But again, uh, reinforcement learning is a very very hot topic these days. We discuss it, and there's a lot of research that needs to be uh, uh, produced, right? And when we see the applications, we see that basically, as I said. So tell me. Uh, so whenever banks, asset managers, right, look at that, uh, you see there's, there's literally no place in finance in which, in which um, supervised or unsupervised or enforcement in some way, of, uh, shape or form cannot be used, right? You see it's, it's basically, uh, uh, it's basically can, can be used for earnings prediction with this prediction, algo trading, credit losses, credit ratings, uh, to, 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 to measure sustainable development goals, scores, and so on and so forth, right? And in unsupervised, is whenever, as I said, we, we, we want to we have a better sense of the data sets, and we just don't ask questions. We try to see if the data is organized somehow, right? 
uh, using clustering, using PCA, right, using encoders, using decoders, right? So, uh, um, and now reinforcement learning is can we learn uh, the policy, can we learn the best training policy, can we learn the best option replication policy, right? And also, uh, a very interesting place in which can be used is marketing strategies in the sense that, right, uh, uh, banks have huge data sets in which they have millions of clients that have done millions of things, right, they know their states, they know what they did, right, and obviously some sort of try to set this as a reinforcement learning problem, right. Okay, so um, today, tonight, we're going to discuss specifically one of these, right, uh, one of these buckets, which is deep learning, which happens to be also very useful to all the others, right? So we'll see, uh, as you all know, that deep learning is basically, right, uh, the engine. It can be the engine for reinforcement learning, is the engine for, right, can be the engine for your regression problems, can be the engine for also unsupervised learning, right? Okay, so we can some sort of set uh, all the three, some sort of problems, right? Uh, as you all know, so many of the most, most famous reinforcement learning applications are deep reinforcement learning applications because uh, deep neural networks are being used uh, as function approximator for the, for, the Q, for the value functions, for the policy networks, and so on. Okay, what is a neural network? I'm sure you all know what is a neural network. It's basically, right, uh, uh, a non-linear uh, function with lots of parameters, right? So we have here the inputs, we have the outputs, we have more than one hidden layer, right? So, um, and in, the, in, 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 every, in every neural, what we're gonna do is a, some sort of a non-linear activation. So we're gonna be, do a non-linear transformation, right? Like here, we have a sequence function, right? So we, we, we have this, uh, we have uh, on the top these, these sums of weights, so this W is an axis, right? Uh, that hit every neuron. In every neuron, we do a nonlinear transformation, and then we can we can obviously uh, some sort of go on and on, right? We can have as many layers, many neurons. Obviously, uh, uh, the issues about uh, deep neural networks is right. Uh, the, the pros and we'll see we'll see in a second the pros and the cons. But there's there's obviously a big a big uh, some sort of uh, warning from statisticians. And and, uh, and 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 engineers that, that told the that told the pioneers that this is not going to work, right? Because you have too many parameters. This is not going to work because it's the non-convex optimization. You won't go, you won't get a global minima. It's not going to work, right? But it did, right? In the, in many contexts, right? So uh, they uh, so Hinton and 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 Benjo and so on and so forth. They found the right combinations of activation functions number of layers, number of neurons, right, that made things work, even if apparently against the, or statistically, right, uh, this shouldn't be the case, right. We have, uh, in terms of architectures, right, and this is one of the other issues, obviously, it's that when we talk about deep learning, we're talking about uh, this large number of architectures that go from the feed forward um, neural network on a multi-layer perceptron, right? It does, it, it's still very flexible, does a lot of things, right? Uh, we have convolutional neural networks, but this is what we, where it's used for, for, for image recognition that can also be tricked to use time series, right? And it has the beauty, the beauty of, com copnets have the, the, the uh, are, are especially, all of them are beautiful, but convolutional neural networks are especially use, useful because they, they some sort of do the feature uh, engineering for us, right? Like they did for for images, right? So copnets can also do uh, the same uh, feature engineering for your time series, right? So it can be shown that that copnets can can be some sort of are are, are some sort of doing exponentially weighted moving average things. The first layer, right? Okay, so. Um, then, then we have long short term memory networks. This is uh, this one, one of the, the, the special, uh, what we call deep, deep learning with memory that can also be recurrent neural networks and so on. Right? And now uh, we have also transformers and so on and so forth. Right? So we have a, right. 
let's discuss let's discuss just a bit before seeing experiments where right what is the pros and the cons right so the pros is that in general right it they work very well right we'll see some examples right that in fact the models results are pretty good right or it's slightly better than the linear models right obviously uh, right uh, what 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 deep nets uh, obviously are able to capture right is uh, obviously nonlinearity and are able to some sort of understand uh, especially well uh, the expressivity of, of the of the of the data set right they can they also show uh, they, they also show a lot of efficiency on time series but we'll see that 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 when we do time series when we do a multivariate time series they seem to be really better than others when, when, we, when we do time series, right, uh, with Apple or, or GP Morgan and so on and so forth, they seem to be very close to the benchmark models, Arimas, and stuff. So they don't seem to be beating, right, uh, right. And for classification problems, they also need, uh, seem to be, right, uh, very, very, right. Um, they also, as I said, the engine of deep reinforcement learning, we just started with deep reinforcement learning in finance, but but anyway, then there's, there's also, uh, there's also as, as, as we, as we uh, uh, analyze or, or we see the merits of deep, deep, uh, of deep uh, learning, we have, to, we have to say something, which is that the, 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 the XGBoost, uh, it's, it's also very, it's always very close, right? Uh, no, uh, XGBoost, so this idea of boosting trees, right? So in time series also, but it also in fact almost seems to be really, very, really, very close, right, to what deep learning does, right? So, so uh, it's uh, Xibus is a, form a formidable competitor, right? In many Kaggle competitions, in, in, in even in time series, right? And Xibus is showing a remarkable, uh, remarkable performance, right? And 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 as you know, Xibus uh, seems to be one of the best techniques when, when you're trying to, to, to marry, right, categorical, right, numerical, uh, so the, the XGBoost seem to be, uh, again, do, doing a lot of feature engineering for you, right? Okay, so you throw, right, uh, 200, 200 factors and you let, uh, let XGBoost to choose, right, and you regularize, right? Well, I'll be discussing the regularization issue in a second. And the cons, the cons are, are, are obviously, right, what, what we hear all, uh, uh, all the time, right? right. You, you want to overfit, right? Um, I'll discuss uh, this idea of overfitting, or we will discuss the idea of overfitting, right? Interpretability is, ob is obviously a big deal, right? So if, you're, if your deep learning model hap uh, uh, happens to be the winner of the competition, so if you're doing a rates model, and you put to, uh, to uh, and 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 you have uh, some sort of of uh, Euler-Lambert models or PCA models, uh, and 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 they're very close to your to your deep to your deep learning, right? And your job is going to be interpretability, right? Because, because with that many parameters, right? Uh, uh, this is. Uh, but I saved the the first for the last, which is. Non-stationarity, which I think is the real issue, right? And we discussed last week in in London. We were discussing, and and, and for example, G G Gary Cousins and I we were saying, right, that one of the main problems we have, right, uh, certainly in finance, is non-stationarity. So it's this idea that that uh, that uh, time series keep changing, right? The DGP keeps changing, and that's really the big deal, right? And we don't have and we don't have uh, really good models for non-stationarity, right? Not only for, for, for models that capture non-stationarity, but also to define it, right? Uh, okay, when you read the literature, sometimes the literature says, oh, all you have to do to deal with non-stationarity is some sort of have, uh, to have the nets more adaptive, okay? So, you train the weights, right? You make them, you make them more adaptive. But we all know that the, the ones that we've been using, uh, linear factor models and all sorts of models, we know that that that, that isn't right. Uh, 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 that isn't a, a good solution in the sense that 
right? Okay, so non stationarity obviously requires much more research, right, and requires much more. But yeah, I think this is the real, the real deal, right? More than, more than overfitting spreadability. The fact that the DGP might be changing and the fact that the nets and the nets were learned how to how to trade S&P 500 stocks, and all of a sudden they find themselves in a different environment, right? Okay, you you can say, oh, we're going to create artificial data. We are we want to use uh, adversarial networks in order to try to make the, the nets more robust. That's true, but still, right? Still, is a big deal, right? And it's a, a really uh, one of the biggest problems we have, right? And reinforcement, uh, sorry, and deep learning, right, uh, or uh, a, a linear, a linear regression, right? They they all be struggling with this idea that that they learn a weighting in environment. If environment changes, right, they might not work well, right. And many people discuss this idea of cats are not really changing that stuff, right. So, okay. What are the modeling aspects, right? So we have some sort of, uh, right, um, uh, the, 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 this is from information theory. So the idea of, of uh, in the end, right, what we're trying to do is, is to compress information. And we have this minimum description length principle, the complexity, so a mono uh, inference theory, right, that they tell us that, that we, we basically, in the, 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 the the, the neural networks or the model with the we need is the model that some sort of compresses uh, information, right, to the shortest pro program possible, right. For example, so a of inference theory is the shortest program that produces a training data based on cohomology complexity. Okay, other qualitative features would be these that I'm sure you all know. So the idea is why, why uh, this deep learning model is so expressive, right? Why do deep learning models have right, some sort of right, extremely large number of parameters right, uh, compared to other traditional statistical models? Right? And uh, okay, we have uh, things that I'll, I'll discuss in a second. Right? But the idea is that, that the, the traditional U-shaped function might not be that way. Right? Might be a double. Right? So we'll see that in a second. Okay, we have two things that we all know. So, so universal approximation theorem is that the peak nets can basically approximate with, with enough layers and neurons anything with arbitrary precision, right? What is not guaranteed is that this is going to generalize. There's no such thing as, as so the, the universal approximation theorem doesn't, right, doesn't guarantee you that it's going to generalize. It just guarantees you that if we see something, this is going to approximate this thing right, very well, right? Uh, or arbitrarily well. So we all know that. And then we also know that that, is, that deep nets are also good for stochastic processes that are basically a learning, right? A learning if there's an Osten-Ullenbeck, if there's mean reversion, etc. The deep nets are going to learn it. Okay, more things. The mo more things that go against right, the, the common sense, so to speak, was this idea. There's a paper by Zhang et al. that shows this idea of we were thinking that regularization was the way to, was the way to generalize, and it's not, not that way. It's not that easy, so to speak. The idea that simple problems are the path to generalization. So there's a, there's a paper by Zhang, by Zhang et al. that shows that uh, that regularization is neither necessary nor su uh, or sufficient for reducing generalization error, right? Maybe the merits of regularization is that maybe it makes uh, the optimization easier. But I really invite you to, to read the, the paper. Other papers also make, make uh, this point about the intrinsic dimensions of deep neural networks, the idea that, that we cannot measure deep neural networks with the number of parameters, right? That dimensions might be much lower. Right in reality, okay, than just counting the number of parameters. Right now, in the number of parameters is not right. So there's a fantastic paper from last year by Belkin et al. that makes a, a very interesting right uh, some push in the direction of at some point right at some point over parameterized neural networks uh, with, instead of instead of overfitting right. Instead of increasing the generalization error, right, 
uh, when they are over parameterized, they might be entering in a new regime, which is called interpolating regime, right? Okay. So Belkin et al. show, right, uh, it's not easy to replicate the, the results, but they show that, uh, again, deep nets might be uh, entering in a regime in which, yes, you can write some sort of by, by having a huge number of parameters enter a new regime in which your realization error will be lower, right? Because the model here it will be intrinsically low in a measure, right? Okay. Okay. Maybe uh, equipped with larger models, we might be able to discover larger, larger function classes that define interpolating functions that might have smaller norms and might be simpler, right? Okay, so read this paper, right? It's a, it's a, it's a very interesting one, right? And, and it's a very surprise, right? This is goes against, uh, right? Um, and some people have tried to replicate it, it's not easy. But this, is, this, could, do to, this could some sort of explain, right, why in the end they're not overfitting, right? Okay, because you might be here, right? The model might be finding simpler things, right? And in, in, with that uh, number of, right? Okay, so we also have, um, in terms of qualitative aspects, right, so, so uh, other things that I'll not, uh, I won't discuss, but this idea that, that there's, there's uh, uh, some sort of not all layers are created equal, so there's a lot. There's a lot more that needs to be researched, right, uh, uh, obviously, on deep learning, in order to understand, right, but some at all, right, uh, in, uh, have been investigating in this year the raw parameters in different layers, right? And say all no layers are creating weak, are not created equal, right? And so on. So these are right some sort of the, the qualitative aspects of of of, of deep learning, right? Uh, for us again, I think that for us the main issues are 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 we know that the model it, it's it's going it's probably going to find it's going to be it's, it's going to be one of the candidates that, that fits better the data, right? And uh, we need to, right? And it's hard to say, for me at least at this moment, to say that the, the, the deep net is going to be, be dealing better with non-stationarity. I think this is not an unanswered question, right? Questions so far? OK. Okay, so we in terms of in terms of time series. So in terms of time series, right? So we we, we wrote a paper that it's a chapter thirteen of the quantitative uh, finds big data from Tony Guida. It's the thirteenth, right? Uh, in which we some sort of right uh, tested right uh, several models, right, uh, to see if 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 uh, if deep neural networks can help us. Right, uh, do uh, some sort of econometrics, so to speak, so to do prediction uh, in time series, right? And we used uh, several models. Right? We used uh, as as one of the candidates that we think it's 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 more interesting the long short memory networks that I won't uh, be discussing in detail, right? But they are basically have this mechanism, of this this memory cell, the input gate, and forget it gate, sorry, right, uh, and they're basically, right, a good candidate, uh, a better candidate than recurrent neural networks that seem to be dealing with, with uh, uh, long-term memory and cycles, right. So the idea is that, that this can be some sort of, a, uh, and obviously, uh, as you use uh, lag return, this can, this can be some sort of a nonlinear ARIMA, right, a nonlinear BARMA, right, you know that the benchmark models for us are, st are obviously ARIMAs, right? Autoregressive integrated moving average models or the, or the, or the multivariates or the vector autoregression moving average models. This continues to be obviously uh, the benchmark. I haven't, this, I haven't mentioned that, but, but obviously what we need to do is compare the results of our deep learning with, with the benchmarks, right? That are the linear models. Okay. So, uh, in terms of looking at the results, and you can see that in the paper, right? Um, as I said, as I, as I some sort of introduced in the beginning, right? 
we don't see we don't see like for in in this particular example in which you do Apple right and you use long term short term memory networks super vector machines and 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 multi layer fit forward neural networks right all you can do you can see right is something that you will see in your machine learning research all models are very close right in general right. In general, all models are all obviously all, always very close and very weak, so to speak. Right? If uh, right, if you come from machine learning, right, you obviously something that it has a, a, a some sort of an accuracy or a heat ratio of 52 is really disappointing, right? So, but we, as 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 we all know, there's a lot of noise. Uh, there's a lot of noise in time series, right? So so here. Right. Whenever we, we see the different sorry the different stocks and the different models, we don't see the long short term memory networks like being so being like better than other right um, than other neural architectures. But whenever in this other in this other table, we see the results when we do uh, some sort of long short term memory networks with thirty stocks. So instead of just using your own lack returns of the stock, you use 30 stocks, right? And then we have to say that, uh, that long short term memory networks seem to be capturing well or, or seem to find some sort of a, 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 a specificity on, on, on doing that with multiple stocks in, instead of just trying to learn, right, a, a time series of a, of a particular stock, right? Okay. And this will be confirmed in a second because I'm going to show right, uh, the results. These are the results, right, um, doing, so we have five U.S. stocks, Ryzen, GP, Morgan, IBM, uh, General Electric, and Apple, right? Uh, the, 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 um, the sample returns, for, uh, the models were trained for 2016, and then we trained, uh, and then we, the odd sample results are here, right? And, and, and this is the absolute error, right? So the lower, the better. And we see that, that, you know, that if you use convolutional neural networks, if you launch onto, launch onto memory networks, they're, they're uh, first of all, they're all very close, right? So they are very close to the, to the, the standard. Standard would be the ARIMAS, right? So the standard model is ARIMAS, right? So we, we should be comparing that, right? <coughs> And Arima still is, is, is still doing some sort of a, a better job, right? For some of the, the stocks, very close to the others, but very close to deep nets, right? So you would you would say that deep learning. Is, if you do deep learning, right, your model is not going to be in that case very 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 far from the optimal. It's always very close to the best models, right? So if you are to choose blindly, right, the multi-layered fit forward might be some sort of always a good choice, right? You see this consistently. Right, very close to the best model, right? But anyway, right? So uh, on that, on that, this is joint work with Sonam Sugastava, right? Uh, and we, if we do that, we go David Gold prices, right? Here, LSTM seem to be capturing, right? As you see with the mean square error, much better than, for example, we do with stocks, right? So, and this is weekly, right? But we, we're doing that daily. We see, we kind of see the same results of of. Uh, Arima is doing pretty well, right? So that don't sh that that deep learning is not massively some sort of uh, beating uh, some sort of the benchmark models, right? Okay. In terms of factor models, so factor models, if we look at right, so here what it's done is that we pick uh, 218 S&P 500 stocks, right? And the idea is that. Uh, you let uh, the, 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 the deep learning model with fit forward neural networks choose the best, the best stocks. And, uh, and we see here that if we look at information ratios uh, out of sample, this is a linear model, right? And this is the deep nets, right? Uh, the results seem to, be, uh, seem to be better, right? On that respect, right? So, okay. We we haven't tested right uh, XGBoost here, but you can read you can also read uh, the XGBoost uh, experiment on Tony Guida's book. I'm sure XGBoost will be very close uh, to the results of of uh, information ratio of sample. Right. Um, okay. Questions.
So the, the big difference between this one and the previous is that the models here can look at other factors, and their goal is to predict the best performing stocks, while in the previous, the goal is to predict the return of a single stock. Yeah, so the difference between, so yeah, here's a pure time series exercise in which you some sort of uh, use the lag time series, but in the long short term memory that was the same thing. You use the, you, you here do, do it, it's a time series, so you, look, use, you use the lag returns of these stops, and you, you use the lag returns of 30 stops. So you, do a no, uh, you do a bar map, vector, some sort of a nonlinear vector, outer regression. And here, it's a, it's what, what, uh, and here what it's used is uh, factors, right? So P's, uh, so quality, uh, value, momentum, and so on, right? Okay. And results, right? Uh, you would say you would say that that the nonlinear model might be capturing some sort of the nonlinear relationships between, right, these factors and uh, and uh, and the returns, right? Yeah. What you get uh, when, when uh, what you get when doing uh, this is a, a regularized uh, a, 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 some sort of a lasso uh, a lasso model, right? Uh, and this is a, a, a deep neural network. Model. Okay. And the the difference uh, the difference you would argue that this is uh, the nonlinearity, right? And the fact that, right, uh, yeah, questions, yeah. So a really like nice question. Um, when you uh, deploy these nets, you know, you obviously had a lot of hyperparameters to start with, and and also the uh, the you know the training time, uh, the time uh, for which you are training these models. So uh, did, did, uh, you know, did you calibrate them uh, along the way, or did you just have some fixed a priori uh, estimate of them before you? No, we, we no, we basically uh, some sort of uh, used the deep nets. I mean, uh, in sample, I think it was uh, ten years, and then it, we used the out sample, which is three years, right? Yeah. You see, so you learn the, the parameters there, then you use it out sample, right? Was the training period also one of the parameters you you? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's it always is, right? As we as we <coughs> mentioned, as I mentioned before, there's no. Right. Uh, uh, one one of the parameters you you, you you should be investigating always is right. Wh when are you right training your your neural networks? Right. We don't have, uh, to the best of our, of our knowledge, we don't have a good theory that has to be right. Ten years, five years, and so on. Right. But what, what we know is that is that uh, is that uh, if we if we use uh, more data, right. Uh, some sort of um, uh, data from from ten years. It, it's not. It's gonna. It's not gonna contain the, the the same information that three years ago, right? Okay. So you might, what you think you win in terms of using more data, you lose in terms of uh, some sort of the data is less uh, representative, so to speak. Yeah, you can see here, right, in, a, in the LSTFs, right, that, that this is just an example, right, of, of how, right, uh, this is in itself an example of non-stationarity, the sense the deep nets, right, or the LSTMs were very different in all these periods, right, okay. If you inspect the weights of these LSTMs and so on, and the results are very different depending on the period. This is also proof on of non-stationarity, the results of the model. You see what I mean? Okay. So non-stationarity is not a thing that that, that, that is not is not, is a thing that we can investigate from the past, right? In the sense that, that here, right, um, the model was very different than the one used here, right? The weights, basically. Yeah. So the uh, average return here is it the uh, uh, the predicted return of the stock, or is it the, how much money the model actually make? Yeah, it's the 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 uh, the, uh, the money that the, the money that the model made. Oh, yeah. okay. But there are no costs. It's just a pure research exercise, right? So this is uh, based on past data. It's not like in, in practice. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 
we're updating the paper now, right? <coughs> it was until 2015, we're updating the paper, right? Okay. So what we claim in the paper is not that, that so, uh, what we claim in the paper is that only the LSTMs, right, might be some sort of better than your BARMA, than your vector autoregression moving average, just because they're able to capture uh, the nonlinear relationships between, right, uh, variables, right? Okay. So they're going to do a better job. <laughs> and they're going to be learning, right, cycles and, and, and but nothing, uh, but, but, uh, but, but again, you, you have the, the issue of non stationarity always present, right? You don't know if, if what you learn here is going to be useful here, right? Okay. So, so the parameters are also, so one of the, the parameters you need to play is, is the window in which you make the, the neural networks, right, learn, right? Um, so, uh, say for example, the, the training period of 2012 to 2015, does the model learn all of the data before 2012 or it just learn the data uh, within 2012 and 2015? Yeah. Only sure. three years? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I see. Right. The details are on the paper, right? This, this, it's, is closed. Any any more questions? Okay. Uh, uh, what we claim, what we claim in the uh, in the in the paper is not that 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 these deep nets are right. What we claim is that ha that that has to be on your toolbox, right? Okay. Uh, and then in addition to that, right? There's no th no such thing as deep learning that right, needs to replace right the benchmarks you can run arimas and and deep nets right uh, in parallel right okay so uh, these these things are the, thi the the things that are that are decided in the model risk committees of the banks right they see we do a PC for rates for example we do pca we do osten limit and we do deep nets okay deep nets seem to be always as i said deep nets uh, may might not be the others by much, but they're going to be doing always a good job because of their expressiv expressivity, so to speak. They'll always be, right, very close to, right. Um, so some more risk committees have decided, oh, we're going to be running, right, uh, our, our, our benchmark models, but we're also going to look at what are the deep nets telling us, right, because in some re uh, regimes, deep nets are telling us different things. Because deep nets might be, might be learning, I know, things like oil cycles, right? Or second, third order effects that maybe your linear model didn't catch, right? Okay. But that you're not implementing as a benchmark because of they lack interoperability and the, and the performance is not significantly better, right? But you can run in parallel then the models whenever there's a divergence, right? Then maybe the risk committee should sit and discuss why things are right. Yeah? You said you trained the network over the period of the three years, right? Yeah. And you have the, you're using the end, end of the devices or something like this? Yeah, yeah. So you have, you have a, like 700 observations? Observation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, but that's common on deep nets, right? On deep nets, right? You you sometimes have more parameters than than data set, than data points, right? Okay. Our results were robust. I'm not saying right. Results were reasonably robust, right? And the convergence was there, right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, is the factor model you're trying to compare with is the cross-sectional model? Mm -hmm. And yeah. the, then the LSTN is actually time series model. And what's the trading strategy of that? What? The LSTM is a time series model you're training. Yeah, to... yeah. So it's two edges, two different edges sizes. Right? So here we, we use as a as a here here it is used as an ingredient the lag returns of one stock and other stocks, right? And and here right in the in the factor models you're using you use uh, use a bunch of stocks like 500 stocks, like in that case 218 and 200 factors, right? So you know, what the, you know uh, some sort of uh, exogenous, right, some sort of features of these stocks that might indicate things about future returns, right? Okay. And then you long short. You can combine them, right? And then you long short in the factor model, right? That's right. No, well, not here, right? But you know, on, on the other side, we do long short. Here's a long model, long long. Okay? Yeah, okay.
Okay, we need to move on. Okay, and I'll finish with with uh, one other application, which is right, uh, which is uh, right, um, language models, right? So obviously here, right, um, what we have, and we were talk, talking to to uh, Sasha before, right? So uh, again, we were discussing last week why why we are. Why quant is the only way to go these days, right? Our claim, or my personal opinion, on why quant is the, is the way to go is in the sense that, right, now basically, they're basically uh, there's, there's a lot of information being generated on the markets, right, right now. Right now, we have more than ever, right? We have all the text, we have satellite data, we, you have all the alternative data, so some sort of humans Right, cannot deal with that, right? So that's why big data, right, uh, some sort of is, is the way to go in the sense that portfolio managers need need all the big data tools, all right, in order to investigate the market. So otherwise, they they can't absorb uh, that much information. And there's an additional thing that that we have that, that sometimes we don't. Is that machine learning, right, and, and deep learning, especially good for 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 whenever you have uh, these largely dimensional spaces? And obviously, one of the one of the uh, main applications of, of deep learning, right, is uh, so uh, language models, so na natural language processing. Right here, uh, I'm going to be discussing uh, a few minutes about about that, right. So in terms of, right, so there's a lot of things that, that obviously, right, uh, that natural pro language processing uh, might be doing for, for you, or you, right? One is, is discourse processing, semantic interpretation, syntactic analysis, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, we're going to be uh, discussing here, right, uh, uh, one idea that's especially uh, useful, right, that for or files, which is sentiment analysis, right? Um, but these are, these are the kind of things that you can do with language models, right? So uh, from from uh, spell checking, keyword search, finding synonyms. This idea that it's very some sort of right. So it's incredibly. Uh, so, so whenever whenever you see the alternative data industry, you see that one of the main uh, some sort of uh, successes is the, uh, all the web scraping. So the idea that that there's a lot of information on the websites, right? Product prices, dates, location, people, or company names, right? And portfolio managers are willing to right investigate and know all this information. So even something like scraping the internet is incredibly useful for portfolio manager. Portfolio manager might be interested in answering a specific question like, like, uh, what well, is the price policy of Amazon changing? Right? Is the Apple, uh, is the Apple, uh, are the Apple prices changing, or uh, and so on and so forth? Right? Or how is the labor market evolving? Right? So this is. So web scraping is a, is a, some sort of not very quant, but a very efficient way to some sort of search the internet for information changes, right? Uh, that might indicate that things are happening, right? So yesterday we saw an example. Someone was saying, oh, well, in fact, people that was web scraping did know, obviously, uh, uh, in a, a lot of, uh, in advance about Thomas Cook, right? In the sense that you were seeing a deteriorating numbers Right, uh, in, uh, already using alternative data. Right, uh, when looking at the company. Right. Okay, and then uh, okay. One one of the things that that we that uh, that uh, it's being done in finance. Right, uh, is this idea of sentiment. Right. So the idea of reading a text and, and figuring out sentiment and and. Um, because sentiment might be obviously a precursor of momentum, the idea of, and if we think about it, it's uh, the idea of compressing the information about Apple, all the things that have been written about Apple today in a number, right, 
in a number of good or bad, right, might be incredibly useful for the, in this idea of the portfolio manager, right, that hasn't been able to read all the data, right, might have a number, right, that indicates, right, at least if this is good or bad, right, and then it can it can drill down and see if this good or bad is because is because of supply chain problem or because or is it because right I don't know corruption case or uh, a, prob a problem in production and so on and so forth, right? Okay, and we obviously have all the other things, machine translation, dialogue systems, and so on and so forth. Okay, so uh, we, we're not we, we're not going to discuss all this. Maybe right, I'm going to this is obviously okay. But just just for the ones that have never seen the NLP, so it's basically there are two ways. Basically, one way is more the traditional way, which we, in which, uh, for example, uh, we were using uh, uh, words as 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 as, as one vector and then some sort of counting the frequency of these words, right, and doing back of words, thing like that. These are the things that are still uh, being done in the industry. Okay. So let me go to this one, for example. NLP for sentiment analysis. So there's two ways, right? One way is just at least very some sort of Apparently, very too simple, which is counting the number of positive words and the number of positive of negative words, and 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 may and, and comparing the frequency of these guys, right? Okay. Right. So this is the traditional curated sentiment dictionaries, right? So words, right? Um, okay. Uh, with uh, 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 back of word representations that obviously uh, right uh, ignore the word order right uh, and that need to deal with hand design negation features that at least need to be able to deal with uh, with things like what well, Apple results when bad right so things like that right and obviously now uh, the deep learning right so deep learning in the sense that that uh, these NLP models these NLP models, these NLP models in which you just count words and, and frequencies and you make ratios, right, are obviously some sort of uh, not uh, taking into account the context, okay, in which they are used. So you don't, as, as you don't understand the semantics, right, so, um, and what, how can you do that? So you do that first. Uh, you do that using deep learning, and you need to first put the, the, the words into vectors, okay? You, for example, doing word to back, and then uh, doing deep learning with these vectors, with the vector representation of the words. Okay? okay so here I describe, we describe that. So first it was this idea of every word, right? Uh, every word is a vector of zeros and one, and one hot encoding, right? And, and, and this is not very efficient because I need 500,000 uh, 500, vectors, right? And uh, this, is, this is not giving me a, any sense of similarity between words, right? Okay? So model and holder are two completely separate objects while they're very close, right? Okay? So things like that. Okay? And the way uh, machine learners, some sort of... Um, uh, deal, deal with that was with word to back, uh, which I'm not talking about, right? And word to back, right? So it's it's one way to uh, consider to create vectors, right? Um, in which you can compare one word with, with other words. So that vectors are are 300 entries vectors, for example, can be right. And then there's a notion of of of, of, of proximity and similarity, and so on. So, okay, so if we look at now at the most advanced model, right, uh, it's, it's uh, this bird, right, that it's a bidirectional encoder representation from transformers, right, that was uh, sort of invented by, by some, some Google researchers, right, that has 
some sort of this uh, complicated architecture. Bidirectional, by, by the way, means that, that instead of uh, reading in one direction, you, you read in two directions, you get a better sense of, right, of the position of the words, right? And, 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 and it's more suitable for, for distributed computing and so on, right? Okay, it has also empirical advantages compared to the, the, uh, the, some sort of the OMO, that was the long shot in memory networks, right? Uh, BERT uses the self-attention, uh, self right? Uh, instead of, that has no locality bias, and, and there's also more efficiency, right? Okay. So, um, and BERT is especially efficient, right? You see that it beats, so F1 scores, right, are better than human performance for some tasks, okay? And it's open source, and you can train it, uh, right? And we did that ourselves, for example, I did that with Tian Haoli, right, uh, and what you uh, student, right? And uh, with the pre-trained models, we just needed 17 minutes with GPU score, we went to the IMDb data set, which is a labeled data set of movies, right, and reviews, and we achieved, uh, or, or the model, basically, the model achieved uh, an accuracy of 97% and F1 score of 96, okay? So the model is incredibly <coughs> complex, right, uh, when you look at it, right, but again, implementation is not that hard, right? So, uh, the, so you could imagine, uh, you could imagine that, that now if you, have, uh, if you have a financial data set in which you have the headlines, right, and labeled data, labeled data means someone that says, okay, this is good for Apple, this is bad for Apple, right? Like Bloomberg or Ravenback, right? Okay, if you have the data set, you can train, right, your bird and see if, if now in the future, maybe you don't, obviously you don't need humans reading, but BERT can be doing that for you, right? In order to do that, obviously BERT should be trained on, uh, uh, on, on a finance corpus, right? It needs, to be, uh, it needs to learn the financial lingo, right? Uh, one other important thing about, about uh, why, why BERT, right, in uh, preliminary results was better than other models, BERT seems to be understanding better than numbers. So text has numbers, right? And the language problem, the language model, needs to be dealing well with numbers. Numbers are an essential part of the financial text, right? Sometimes numbers are uh, a EPS. Sometimes numbers are what? Sometimes numbers are uh, a date, right? 27 September, a number of components, right? So the language model need also to understand if this is a percentage. If this is something relevant for the for the for the for the for the context, this is just an ordinal number, and so on and so forth. So numbers are one of the things that language models again needs to understand better, at least in the finance context, right? In others, right? Uh, and we we saw that that BERT is 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 exceptionally well at understanding the 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 uh, the, um, the numbers on the headlines. It's able to represent well the numbers, okay? And then we don't have a lot of time, but, right? Uh, well, for, a, for the ones that have seen deep learning, right? Uh, sorry, reinforcement learning, right? Uh, so uh, you see that in all the good, uh, in, all the bad, in all the applications, basically, in order to figure out the value, the, the value function or the Q function, right? You need function approximators, Right and and what is the best function approximator available for us? Right, it's obviously right deep learning. Okay, so this is uh, some sort of a conclusion, right? So this is the idea of where can you use the different the different um, some sort of in, 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 in the different um, techniques, the multilayer perceptrons, the memory networks that can be RNNs or the memory networks, the copnets. Right. Let me mention something about the covenants, right? So we've seen that the idea, so we have a lot of visualization um, tasks in, in banks or, or, 
for credit profiles and stuff, right? And we also have this idea of unsupervised learning especially hard, right? In order to figure out distances. So we think cognets might be much more useful than we, we thought, right? Because the idea of transforming data into images and then throw the cognets. Okay. So you transform the data set into an image and then you throw a cognet to see if the cognet is understanding be better, right? Is understanding better, for example, is doing a better unsupervised learning than uh, clustering. Okay. So I think this is a very, very interesting idea that I've seen recently, right? And think about those problems, right? In which it's very hard to grasp, right? But maybe we can transform them and throw the cognates that seem to be so well at understanding spatial, right, uh, uh, and so on. So I think this is something that we, right. And also cognates are, are easy to trick into time series, right? So again, at the beginning with, uh, with, with some sort of set cognates and only for, for image recognition are useful to us, right? And then they can be used for, for time series. They also they can be used on this idea of transforming things into images and then throwing the cognates, okay? And see the cognates understand better than, for example, credit profiles, right? You transform the credit profile into an image, right? And then you throw the cognates to see, right? And they're able to, to produce classes and classify, okay? And then the autoencoders, which is this idea that I haven't mentioned. So these idea, the inputs and outputs are the same, right? And you just put uh, you just put the, the neural networks into understanding uh, the primary nonlinear structure, right, of this data. Okay. So the inputs look at the same inputs and try to create uh, a more compressed nonlinear representation of, right? Okay. So you can do that in TensorFlow. It's, it's 15 lines of code, right? It's 15, right? It's so more than that, okay? So, but the old multi-layer, right, can, can also be used in a, in a variety of different tasks. They also do, right, and you can use them in prices, returns on factors. They can classify and regress. Issues are, right, what I said, right? So we throw this, this is easy to implement, and then our job is gonna, is gonna be how can we deal with non-stationarity? How can we use? How can we interpret right, that uh, and overfit it? Right? The memory networks is basically the same. So the main question is not if the LSTMs are suitable for, for time series regimes and not. Yes, of course. Right? But the idea is, is the environment going to change? It's going to be stable enough so that I can use them in the future. Right. I think this is the main question, not if the LSTM is not a good uh, econometric, right? Uh, uh, the cognets, right, can be used in, 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 uh, in, in all of that, so to speak, right? With the same and autoencoders that are basically especially useful for, for uh, covariance matrices, right? This idea of, of doing non, uh, some sort of a nonlinear PCA, okay, and then you can also do encoders, uh, autoencoders as a as a as an engine for your know, factor models then, okay. And obviously, right, uh, what well, well, we mentioned about the language models, right? Okay, a language model, right? If you talk, if you if you talk about uh, we could add here something that it's not, it's the transformers. So transformers, which is the, what is used in BERT, right, can also do memory, can also do ev everything, but it's a more sophisticated. I haven't seen examples, but transformers can also give in category here. Right? Okay. Because the language folks seem to be very creative, right, with their architectures, right, So, right, uh, we think it's worth, right, that uh, the data scientists, quants, some sort of learn uh, how to implement uh, all these things in TensorFlow, right? 
Okay, we think that the majority of these models, right, can be implemented, right? It's reachable, right? So it's not unreachable, right? Um, and the example is BERT, right? We managed to some sort of work and, 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 and BERT and do it in, in around three or four days, right? It wasn't more. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of open source code out there, right? Okay. You need to train it in a in a financial, but it's it's not unreachable, right? It's not unreachable. This is open source, so you don't need to create. <laughs> Questions? Yeah. So just curious, have you heard about like online learning instead of batch learning? Like, what's your what's your opinion about online learning compared to batch learning? Mm -hmm. Which sense? <laughs> Like, because uh, my company is a build a machine learning framework by using online learning compared to uh, instead of a batch learning. And there are some like a statistic uh, paper saying that online learning has a, will achieve a better result compared to the batch learning. Just want to hear what, what, what's your opinion on that. Yeah, I, I, I would be fantastic. I, I, don't, I don't have a, right, we, we, I don't have experience on that. I can't, right? Sorry about that. <laughs> I have a question, sort of maybe a little bit for researchers and maybe our, our students in mind, which is uh, there's maybe a, a list of 20 models one could choose. There's a list of maybe 20 applications that you could use, and maybe uh, 20 sources of data. So if you, you know, if you multiply all these numbers, it's a bit overwhelming for you know a student or a researcher to sort of know where to. What to become an expert at, or what to focus on. Oh so yeah, yeah. What, and, and you've given us a really great bird's eye view of of everything that's out there that fits uh, under AI or machine learning. But how how would you describe sort of how you navigate from you know one type of model to a different type of data set to a different like how yeah. do you stumble on these things and decide what you're doing next? Yeah. So so. Well, I, I think this is, this is, this is, I don't know, the domain experts come to you and say we have an XBA problem, right, and we want to try machine learning, right. Uh, we have, uh, yeah, prediction pro, we want to try reinforcement learning. So I, I think, I think uh, machine learning is very, uh, sorry, finance is very empirical. So what it's useful in one context may not be useful in, in, in some other. So I think it's a special, uh, case in which domain experts, right, and machine learners should, should be meeting and, and trying to solve problems, right? Because there's a huge amount of problems in finance, right? Uh, right? Uh, this, I, I've shown probably more on, 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 on the buy side problems, but sell side is, is obviously a very fertile ground with uh, FRTV and all these new regulations, counterparty risk, credit risk, it's, it's uh, right, and you don't see papers there, right? There's just uh, an data and option hatching and so on and so forth. So we haven't, right, at, at least there are no papers out there, right? Okay. Yeah? Um, other than uh, BERT, are there any other uh, cutting edge uh, NLP deep learning models that, can, that are used in finance? Uh, no, the answer is uh, the answer is that the best of my knowledge. When we talk with, when we talk to, let's go back here. When we talk to the the the, the leaders of NLP, that might be I don't know, right? Who's who's the right? I don't know, Ravenpack or who else? Bloomberg, Reuters, and so on and so forth. They still tell you, right, that the the language models are, are this sit 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 comfortably or not, but sit more here. In the sense that, to the best of our knowledge, right, people are still not using deep learning, right? Are still, are still using uh, handcrafted approaches in which you want to be sure that you, that you capture GP Morgan. Let, let, let's think about, uh, let, let's step back, right? What do you need to do in order to understand that an article Right, 
the sentiment of an article. You need to classify the topic. You need to classify the entity. You need to classify relevance, and so on, right? Mm -hmm. So all these first classifications, right, in which you need to figure out if this, if this article is related to J.P. Morgan, right, people still has a bunch of people, right, putting together dictionaries, right, uh, in order to describe uh, J.P. Morgan, Jamie Dimon, largest American bank, you see what I mean, making sure that uh, you have, and all the typos, all the typos. Maybe the Nets haven't seen a typo. Maybe the Nets haven't seen a typo, and, the, and you're not reading something that it was very relevant for J.P. Morgan, right? So people is still doing traditional, more handcrafted, right, in which they control, right, and they do uh, super vector machines and so on, and we're seeing that 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 it was it was uh, you can do uh, some sort of long shot the memory networks, and they were pretty well, and 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 everybody's looking at bird, right? So I don't know if you have another experience on that or views or. Uh, no, uh, well, uh, it's I thought of you, but it's probably better to discuss it after the meeting. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yeah. Obviously, I cannot. All, obviously, right. Uh, but, but, uh, yeah. But I, I would say that at least on the published research, right, to the best of our knowledge, BERT seems to be the state of the art, right. And, 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 and I, I guess that all the composite to NLP are are right now, right, uh, looking at BERT closely, right. But. Uh, uh, yeah. So uh, from the buy side perspective, uh, we always thinking about investing stock in a long short way, so cross sectionally. Um, do you have any certain idea or thought that we can share in adapting the LSTN into a cross sectional way, or is that a for more directional investing? No, I think it's. I think I don't, I think the more is flexible enough in the sense that you can do, give it lack returns, you can also give it lack factors, for example. <laughs> LSTMs would be navigating too, right? But we haven't tested that. But you can have some sort of a, a model in which you have lack factors, <coughs> lack returns, everything, right? And you ask the machine learning model to make sense of, of lack returns and lack factors, right? But uh, this is very ambitious, right? But Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, coming back to the LSTMs, uh, did, did you systematically vary the say you know the uh, you know depth of the of the number of nodes and see how the performance changes as you uh, you know do that? And uh, if uh, for instance, if you achieve like monotonicity, then you uh, achieve the interpolation threshold, and you know you're not overfitting. So, have you done something like that, or do you think it's, it's possible? Yeah, it's it's in the paper, right? But uh, yeah. And, and now we're working on the updates, so we'll see that soon. Right? You'll see that soon. So you, you, you know you would achieve the interpolation threshold, I'd right? say, like a high confidence, or have you, have you like, what, can you modify that? Yeah, we'll show you that. Yeah, okay. yeah, I can't. <laughs> Any other? Uh, one last question. Yeah. I think um, as you said that uh, RCM and comments they usually perform a kind of feature. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So as you said in the lecture, uh, ComNet and STM they usually have a very good, uh, like, uh, like doing the uh, feature uh, operations uh, on, on the data sets. Uh, however, uh, it's, uh, it also means that the model, the parameterization, of the model is very delicate. Uh, mm -hmm. So that means that we need to put a lot of efforts into uh, the, the parameter part. Sure. Uh, so how do you think that's uh, is that a blocker for like uh, for uh, many applications of uh, uh, machine learning in finance? Because from my experience, when I uh, try to apply. Uh, that kind of models, it kind of 
um, makes me because the signal usually or like over overshadowed by the by the noises a lot. So I have to find the fine tune the uh, parameters. So even it's feasible to find the, the optimal values. Uh, it may take um, immense uh, time efforts to reach that point. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So it's you know. So what you're saying, so, so yeah, so, some things are an NP problem, right? In the yes, sense that yes. it's a combinatorial problem you would need, right? Uh, yeah, that's that's why you need human data scientists. They need to make these heuristic choices based on experience, based on, and if you look at what data scientists do many times is that they some sort of have an intuition on the parameters of Right, of the super vector machines, or or on the XG boost, right? Uh, what is the, the the length of the tree? So the, the, you can develop some sort of an intuition after you work with several data sets, right? But uh, that help you on this search. But otherwise, you cross validate. <laughs> so we don't know the answer. You cross validate, so to speak. But there's no. Right. So do you think that there's going to be a meta learning methods that is uh, that can help the people expedite the, the process of the mm -hmm. parameter selection Yeah, yeah, I think. Uh, but uh, but yeah, again, again, some of these problems are right, and 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 as and, and if you look at the li uh, just just if you look at the literature of of deep nets, right, just just for a second, right, if, if uh, we're still trying to understand these, right? Yes. I think uh, you would say we we think about that. We we all we're still trying to understand these, in the sense that there's not there's a few papers on mathematics. <coughs> there's a, a good paper by by NYU uh, on mathematics of deep learning. If you read the the paper, you see no equations. So basically, also mathematicians. The mathematicians are some sort of trying to understand. Why is so good? But qualitatively, right? Because mathematically, it's very hard, right? To some sort of understand what's going on, right? And for the parameters, it's a little bit the same thing. But but anyway, you after you've done ten times XGBoost, you some sort of develop an intuition of on the on the on the parameter space, right? I don't know, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, let's let's thank Michelle. Yeah. Oh, yeah, by the way, you can build my design data product homework with me. Like, the homework is a lot. There I answer. Like, like, my homework is a kind of like, but, but he was going very technical, like, Albert like, there are now, like, two building the algorithm,
have yet to read up on this. Uh, that paper. Uh, uh, I'm really excited about uh, MX. I'm going to let you say about the American. I don't know. Maybe you will find out all the regressions and the muscles and the deep and nonsense because you basically the, the, the past has never been good to help you with the future. Never, ever. So then, yeah. a lot of this thing based on the historical data is going to do, right? And, and if you're going to, if you, and then you're going to say, okay, but I, then I can figure out which one to do. But that's one reference. Yeah. Otherwise, it's just uh, some sort of a very, it's like a very illly defined reinforcement learning problem, which is based on the background that are so this would mean that you have once again saying we have to put all of it even if you know it. Then when you ask it, no one says, oh, we don't have a good theory for not such a right. It could be a big question. We can normalize this as that it's not, but if we normalize this as that it's not. And uh, of the soft or quadratic capital, then it means we're barely good, actually not buying anything. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you maybe it's strong in my share or something there. And all of our, you know, it, 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 it's all the more the data mining that, don't get me wrong, it's incredibly useful to do other things. And the final is going to be like this thing is jumped up. I'm very sure it's. I can't remember the one. You may get help. You're like having. Then you can tell because I have a set of pieces what happened.